Let's return Alice and Bob, who are still desperately trying to exchange messages securely online. We talked about symmetric key encryption, in which the same key is used both to encrypt and decrypt messages. So in symmetric key encryption, Alice takes her message, she transforms it using that key to produce the ciphertext, which is sent to Bob, and Bob then transforms that ciphertext using the same key to recover the original message. So this is symmetric key encryption. And symmetric key encryption is very powerful and very important. But you might wonder, how do Alice and Bob agree on this key? That's a problem. There are out-of-band ways to do it. So if you really want to be super secure, you could, for example, meet at a public park and exchange some flash drives or something like that, and you could agree on keys to use. And in really high security situations, uh, or back in the days you know, where uh, we were, uh, you know, countries were spying on each other and stuff like that, that's kind of how you would do it. You would find a way to communicate the secret information in some other way that didn't require the internet or didn't require using communication channels, and then you would use it. But today, there's lots of situations where, for example, I want to go to a website, and I want to initiate the connection with the website securely. So I I have no way. I'm not going to like go into Google's go to Google's headquarters and be like, here's my key I want to use to access your servers. That doesn't make any sense. So happily, there is an alternative to symmetric key encryption. There's something called asymmetric key encryption. And asymmetric key encryption is a much newer uh, encryption system. It uh, develop, was developed out of work, uh, really beautiful mathematical work that people did in the 60s and 70s. And the idea here is that we're going to exploit the existence of these trapdoor functions to build a cryptography system where I can encrypt messages using one key and decrypt them using a different key. So as long as I keep that second key private, that's what is referred to as my private key, nobody can encrypt messages for me. But that first key that's used for encryption, that I can make public. So let's walk through an example of how this would work. So Alice and Bob, now before we had one key, this time we're going to have two keys. So there's going to be something called key P, which is my private key. And Alice and Bob, let's, uh, let's make this a little bit better here. So Alice, let's say Alice's keys are called AP, that's her private key, and this is Bob's key, BP. So that's the private key. That's how they decrypt messages that are sent to them. But there's also a separate key that's called the public key. And the public key, I don't have to keep private. I can publish that. So Alice would put up on her website or somewhere online her public key, and Bob would put up his public key. OK, so far so good. Now, the public key is used in when I'm encrypting messages, when I'm exchanging secure messages, to encrypt the messages. So in order to send a message to Bob, Alice takes the message, the, the plain text message, let me be consistent with my letters here. She takes the plain text message and she, uh, she encrypts it using, sorry, she encrypts it using Bob's public key. And that produces an encrypted message. Now, because of the existence of these trapdoor functions, this, is, uh, the, this, crypto, this encryption system is based on the idea of a trapdoor function. So Alice can perform this. This is an easy computation to perform, but it's impossible to undo unless you're Bob. Because Bob has this secret piece of information that he can use to undo that transformation. So this message is sent across the internet to Bob. Bob receives the message, and then he, he uses his private key to recover the original message text. So note that Alice and Bob don't have to agree on a secret key here that's used both for an encryption and decryption, because doing that is hard over an insecure channel. In this case, because there's one key that's used for an encryption and one key that's used for decryption, I can publish to the world the key that you need to use to encrypt messages before you send them to me and keep private the key that allows me to decrypt those messages. So let's finish the example. How would Bob send a message to Alice? So in this case, what Bob needs to do is he needs to take the message and he's going to encrypt it using Alice's public key. And then he's going to send that message to Alice. And Alice then is the only person, assuming she's the only person that has her private key, that can take this message 
and use her private key to recover the original message text. So another way to put this using a different diagram is that for a symmetric key encryption system, I have to get to from the plain text, sorry, keep this, from the message to the encrypted message and from the encrypted message back to the message, you all both use the same key. Whereas with, a public, with an asymmetric key encryption system, I use one key to encrypt the messages and a different key, a private key, to decrypt the messages. So this public key is published to everybody. Anybody can use it to send me an encrypted message. This private key, I have to keep safe. I have to keep that secret because that's how I'm going to uh, decrypt messages that are sent to me. So asymmetric encryption based on the notion of a backdoor function makes it possible for two parties to initiate a secure conversation without having to agree on the key that you would have to agree on if you were using symmetric key encryption.